Um, hey everyone, welcome to the 177th meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. This is a special additional meeting, but we'll count it. Um, tonight we're, uh, we're going to be hearing from Tom Santero with an introduction to Basho's React, uh, an open source key value uh, data store, also known as a, a NoSQL database. Um, so tonight, uh, before we get going, please silence your cell phones. Uh, please don't go to the coffee maker. Um, Please don't eat snacks that have noisy wrappers or anything else that will kind of um, make it difficult. Also, if anyone wants to come to the front, the sound is going to be better up here to be able to interact a little more. I know we all like to, to sit in the back from school, but it's it's a little harder to hear and it might get a little rough during the presentation. Um, and what we're going to do is please hold your questions until the end. Um, and when, when we do do questions, we'll bring the mic around to you so everyone can hear your question, okay? Um, we'd also like to quickly thank the Huffington Post for this space. Uh, we'd also like to thank our other sponsors, IBM, Google, Canonical, Brand Or Group, and O'Reilly Media for their continued support. In addition, Dialog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who have contributed greatly over the years and continue to. Um, after the meeting, we are going to be going to Central Bar at 109 East 9th Street, so please join us. Come on over, have a drink, talk to the presenter, talk to, uh, to your fellows. Um, and let's see. Yeah. So announcements. Does anyone have a? Does anyone have anything they want to announce? We're gonna lead out with that now. Anyone? I okay. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna take care of that in a second. All right. So okay. So from the Nylog side, our next meeting will be the regular February meeting. We're going to be having George Neville Neal do a comparative survey of FreeBSD and Linux, and it looks really interesting so far. I think if you guys haven't used FreeBSD or any of the BSDs, it'll be an interesting presentation. If you have or have feelings one way or the other, you know, come on over and discuss it. Uh, on the workshop front, the location for a workshop has been the Hudson Library. However, it's closed for renovations for a few months, and we're looking for suggestions for alternative space. We're close to one, but just in case that falls through, we're still looking for suggestions from everyone. So if you have an idea of a place where a small group of people, less than 20, could sit down, do some programming, and talk uh, twice a month, um, let us know. Please get in touch with uh, Rob, David, or James. Uh, they'll raise your hands, guys. All right, you can see them. We'll plug you. We'll plug you really well. Yes, <laughs> if you give space, that we you'll be up here uh, every month for a while. Um, or we're okay with that if you want, anyway. Um, in case you missed it, you can grab a Linux distro DVD from the back shelf over there, just if you're interested in trying one and you haven't bothered downloading it and burning it, there's one there for you. Um, and uh, I announced this in our last meeting, but it's worth repeating, and that is Nylug has been operating for 15 years now as of this January, so thank you all again. Um, and uh, Caitlin from Huffington Post would like to say something to you all. All right, can you hear me? No? A little bit. All right, well, thank you all so much for coming. I'm really glad that you guys came out in the snow. Um, I'm from Huffington Post. We love hosting meetups, and we're also, um, we just started a vertical for Huffington Post called HuffPost Code. It's all about development and coding, and we're always looking for people who want to write. Um, so if you want to you know, write about something, you want to get exposure, um, you know, please reach out to me. I've left a stack of business cards back by uh, the, the DVs over there. Um, and uh, please let me know if your meetup is looking for space. Thanks. All right, great. Um, so last, uh, please hold your questions till the end again. And please welcome Tom Santero. We out. All right. Everybody here we are. Cool. So yeah, I'm Tom Santero. Uh, I'm T. Santero on Twitter. I'm T. Santero on Twitter. And you should follow me, if not for nothing, just because my friend Ashley always makes fun that uh, she has a lot more followers than I do. So uh, follow me, please. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely thanks again to Huffington Post for hosting us. Uh, thanks to you all for coming out, especially with this weather. Um, 
So yeah, I work for this company called Basho, and we do some really cool computer science, uh, distributed systems. If you're interested in distributed systems, if you're not sure about distributed systems, and you want to learn a little bit more, uh, the company Stripe, the payment processor, they actually just started a capture flag thing today. It runs for about a week, and they're focusing really on a whole bunch of topics of distributed systems, and it looks like really fun, uh, so I would encourage you to check that out. Uh, so what do we do at Basho? Well, we make database. Um, and we also make a lot of memes. Uh, you'll be privy to those if you end up following me on Twitter. Um, and I want you to buy my products. So, you know, you dial now and you'll get not one, not two, but five nodes of React for only 700 easy payments of 1995. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about it. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> okay, all right, so seriously. Can you sell that fish? <laughs> so this is actually available on Teespring, um, and I'll send you the link after. So we're going to talk about React tonight. Uh, show of hands, who here has used, played with, dabbled, or even looked at the documentation for React in the past? Cool. Anyone here using it in production? All right, we'll change that. So. React is a distributed database, it's key value, and we're going to get into the juicy details about why that's interesting, why that's important, why you should actually care. This, I promised, would be an incredibly technical conversation tonight, which it certainly will be. Uh, but I do want to say that uh, React, we open sourced it, it's Apache 2 license, we also sell it. Uh, but it's Apache 2, we open sourced it back in August of 2009. Uh, we're about to hit, hit version 2.0, excuse me. Um, and it's deployed by big companies, small companies, governments, uh, and it's actually really interesting. Uh, just to give you an example of what people are using React for, uh, the entire healthcare systems of both the United Kingdom as well as the uh, country of Denmark store all their patient records in React. Uh, the whole idea is that it's a critical piece of your infrastructure, these types of systems that can't ever go down, that must always be available. That's the kind of database that we build, and if that's the kind of database that you're interested in, uh, you're about to find out a little bit more about it. So, a little bit of an overview. React's written in this programming language called Erlang, which was invented by Sony Ericsson back in the 80s. It's really good for building concurrent fault-tolerant distributed systems. You can basically build databases and telephone networks with Erlang. Um, and message queues. So it's an implementation of Amazon's Dynamo paper. The Dynamo model is something that came out of Amazon in 2007. They wrote and released a white paper. Uh, side story, the authors of that white paper almost got fired for releasing that information. So that's why you don't ever see any more white papers from Amazon. Uh, and effectively, Dynamo was the system that Amazon, pre-AWS, the system that they built to uh, maintain their shopping cart. The whole idea is that Jeff Bezos came down from on high and he talked to all of his software engineers and he basically made an edict saying that not one of you could ever deploy a piece of code that goes into production that prohibits a customer from giving us money. So they took a look at uh, the tens of thousands of servers that they had running in multiple data centers across the world that were processing millions of transactions each single day and they realized that what they needed was a new solution instead of the many, many, many instances of MySQL that they're running at the time, that could effectively provide a fault tolerant and highly available data store. They ended up building something, uh, coupling together a whole bunch of different technologies that had been talked about, discussed in uh, academia, as well as in industry for 20, 30 years, and they sort of coupled them all together, and it came out to be this really, really interesting thing uh, that we call Dynamo, and React is one of a few flavors of Dynamo and Spire databases. So, it's a key value store, and the whole idea is that you store objects into this key value store. Uh, your objects have keys and values. You can assign the keys, or you can let the database choose the key for you, and uh, that's pretty much it. That's what gets persisted. Uh, the whole idea with a highly available store, something that's uh, always on and resilient to fault, so, is that we store replicas, copies of these, uh, of, of these keys that you're putting into the database, and those replicas go to multiple machines. So if, if one of them happens to fail, you still have a couple of other machines that actually serve your request, uh, take your request, and so on and so forth. So jumping right into it, 
React Dynamo systems, they exist on multiple machines. It's a masterless system. With React specifically, it's, uh, you deploy it on a mesh network, so all the nodes in your cluster happen to have knowledge of all of the other nodes. They all work together in a core to effectively give you what is known as the database service, as React. So typically, if you were to actually deploy this uh, you know, in your own data centers or on AWS, whatever the case may be, you'd simply put you know, something like a load balancer in front of uh, React and your application, and sort of round robin every single request that you would send to the database, and uh, effectively what that means is that React on the other side, any node that happens to get your request, is able to process that request. Even if the physical host that you just connected to does not have the data or should not be responsible for persisting the data that you're putting into the database. And we actually achieved that with this concept known as consistent hashing. It's sort of an abstraction on top of uh, naive or modulo-based hashing when you have multiple services that you need to uh, talk to, you take a key, you hash it, and instead of just doing a modulo over the number of servers that you happen to have, what you actually do is uh, 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 do uh, a consistent hash, you, and the hash is uh, going to map to a certain space in the total, total key space. And that is what's known as the ring. So in React, we use a SHA-1 uh, hashing function, um, and it's a 160-bit integer key space. What we end up doing is we tokenize it into a fixed number of evenly sized partitions. So in this particular example, there's 64 partitions in our ring. And the physical nodes, as denoted by these colors that I don't have a legend for, uh, end up making up the, uh, claiming responsibility for all of these different partitions, such that when you actually go to hash a key, it's always going to map to one of these spaces. We're able to persist the object to whatever machine owns that partition, and the next couple, if you were to walk it clockwise, for the extra replicas. So this allows us to reason about how, where the data is stored at any given time, because any host that happens to receive a request simply needs to apply that consistent hash, and it knows which servers that it needs to talk to in order to find the, uh, find the data. So React allows us to have this concept of dynamic membership. Uh, the whole idea of scale, web scale, adding and removing hosts is very important if for some reason you have to add more capacity to your cluster whether you want to get a little bit more storage capacity, you need a little bit more compute, uh, computational power, so on and so forth, React makes it incredibly easy simply to add nodes to a cluster. You install React on the new host, you point it toward any uh, existing member of the cluster, and React is going to take this ring and it's going to redistribute certain data, redistribute responsibility for some of these partitions. That data is going to move to the new, uh, new node that's joining the cluster and, uh, and try to keep as even a distribution of data as possible. We already discussed the fact that our uh, data is replicated. Uh, by default, it's three, but this is a configurable uh, factor. So if you were to take a look, obviously, uh, it's you know contiguous, uh, just like in this particular diagram. So we've got this concept of a pref list, a preference list, and uh, as you can see, this is how, uh, this is basically the equivalent to a replica set where any, any sort of key that I would hash would end up going to at least one of these particular partitions and then the next two or whatever the replication factor happens to be. So again, this is a database. It's designed for high availability. Uh, the formal definition of high availability is any non-failing node can respond to any request. Seems pretty simple, right? Uh, failures happen to happen all the time. There's some really interesting research by companies like Microsoft and other large companies that have uh, huge data centers, and we realize that, you know, mean time between failures, while they, while they may be getting smaller and smaller as our software and our, as our hardware uh, gets uh, better and better over the years, they still, happen, uh, they still happen on a constant basis, whether it's a hardware failure, whether it's a network partition, whatever the case may be. So any non-failing node being able to service any request is actually uh, key. In React, there's a lot of fault tolerance behaviors to deal with failure situations, such as if a node happens to be offline and you're trying to write to it, it'll use a fallback, spin up a, uh, a, a new node to take any sort of write requests. Uh, once a failure goes away, uh, hand the data off back to its original owner, uh, and so on and so forth. This is something I stole from Wikipedia. Uh, anyone here familiar with the CAP theorem and the whole uh, concept of eventual consistency? 
All right, cool. So those of you who have experience with databases, uh, relational databases, ACID compliant databases, haven't had to deal with certain wonkiness. And the real meat of this talk is going to be discussing what happens in the face of concurrency, concurrent writes, what happens when you have a network partition and you try to write data on one side of the partition from one application server, data to the other side of uh, the other partition, uh, and how do you sort of reconcile that? So, you know, eventual consistency, basically when things are okay, eventually all the data is going to be propagated to replicas. So we have a couple of things that we have to take, uh, that we sometimes take for granted in the applications that we build, uh, but when you start to think about things in a distributed environment, it's really important to recognize uh, what sort of framework and constructs we're working with. What I mean by that is, this is communication across multiple servers that are connected with networks. They're using QCP. Uh, we can't rely on the fact that our packets are going to be delivered and ordered uh, in the same way that we sent them. We can't rely on packets being delivered at all. Uh, there's plenty of things like TCP and CAST where simply you can overload your routers and completely lose data and it makes you wonder what is going on and no graph and no metrics in the world can actually uh, tell you that until you realize uh, you deploy the wrong hardware in your, in your data center. So eventual consistency is something that sometimes it takes a little bit to wrap your head around uh, and this is one of the costs of having any available non-failing node being able to serve any request. It means that sometimes you could try to update an object from two different uh, applications and that would be write contention and you have to deal with that. So let's talk about an example. We've got two writers and in this example I've got this tuple here uh, where the basic syntax is going to be writer, value, and time. Writer is who's writing this, which application. The value is just uh, what the value is going to be. And time is just something, for example, so that we could reason about, you know, in a wall clock sense, when things happen. So, these are our three replicas. The pink one here was written by A, it has value one, and it was written at time one. The one in the middle, the blue, it was written by B, has value one, and it was written at time two. Uh, and A, value one, time one, on the third replica. So there was a write contention, it's a race condition effectively, uh, and we have to sort of deal with this conflict, uh, this conflicting update to our database. So there's two options that we have. We could just simply say, all right, well, the last one that made it, that wins. And that's what uh, a lot of databases do, that's what Cassandra does, for instance. Uh, this is optional with Reoc. But we also expose to you other functionality, uh, which we'll get into. So last write wins in our example, the writer would be, uh, the, the, the writer that wins would be B since it came in at time two. It was received later. Now mult means we actually keep both values. This means we're not throwing away data based off of something arbitrary, like when a machine happened to receive a TCP packet. Um, again, our network is inherently asynchronous. We cannot trust them. We rely on them, but we can't trust them. So allow mult effectively means for something in the case of REOC is we create what we call siblings or sibling values. And the next time you go to read whatever key we just stored, uh, it's going to say, hey, you've got siblings and you have to resolve them, which is a little bit of a pain. Uh, but don't worry because there's some really, really cool technology that we're putting into REOC version 2.0 so you don't even have to think about this. Um, so we're gonna talk about that. It's a uh, concept called a CRDT. Uh, convergent replicated data types, it's a mouthful. Uh, another mouthful, commutative replicated data types, there's two types. Uh, we're gonna focus mostly on the convergent type. Um, since there's two types, typically CRDTs are referred to as conflict-free replicated data types. And as I mentioned, when we have a write conflict, when multiple uh, applications are trying to write to the same key at the same time, uh, is this is going, these data structures are distributed data structures that automatically resolve any sort of write conflicts so you don't have to. Uh, if you were to create siblings in React today, you would have to have some sort of exception handling in your code that at write request or at read request, if you detect siblings, you have to do something to them. And you could expose some sort of business logic to choose which value should be the canonical value that gets persisted back to React to get rid of the conflict. Or you could just do some common things like just merge the values together. This is 
that wonkiness that we used to see all the time on Amazon uh, because they did this stuff. They kept the the, uh, the siblings, and you know, every once in a while you go to check out, and you only put one version of that or one copy of that book into your uh, into your shopping cart. But for some reason, when you checked out, or maybe you didn't even notice, you actually ended up buying two books, uh, and that's because network partitions happen. Uh, so. These are data structures that don't require synchronization. So what that means is we don't have to worry about locking or some sort of other asset guarantee in order to reason about what my final value is going to be. And I'll explain exactly how we do this. So uh, we're going to get a little computer science-y for a minute. Uh, they're monotonic and they're confluent. Effectively, what that means is they're monotonic. They can only grow in information. You can never remove information from these uh, data structures, uh, which is, uh, when you stop to think about it, very important when we have to start to reason about uh, the order of events, when things happened, uh, and when things were written to the database. They're confluent, meaning they can just merge together. Thus, they're convergent data structures. Uh, we create siblings, and then we resolve them by merging the values together. So there's a lot of theory, if you actually are very interested in, uh, in this at the end, that I would encourage you to check out. There's this research institution in France called INRIA. Uh, Mark Shapiro, Carlos Becquero, a whole bunch of other really, really smart mathematicians uh, figured out all of this stuff uh, over the past 10 years, and they're still trying to figure it out. Uh, so this is one really good paper, a comprehensive study of convergent and commutative replicated data types. Uh, an optimized, conflict-free replicated set. There's probably like a good six or seven papers at this point. Uh, with about you know 50 pages of math each, if, uh, if that's what you guys like to do on your weekends like me. Um, and there's also a whole bunch of other stuff that we won't get into. But if you remember uh, your calculus from high school or college, uh, these data structures, they're bounded joint semi-lattices. Basically, they're partially ordered sets, and we just compute the least upper bound. And all we have to do, since these are data structures that are formally verified, we have to maintain uh, and, and prove that they can maintain uh, their properties of associativity, commutativity, and item potence, which we're about to get into. And that's what allows us to know that at any conflicting right that goes into the database, we could always know that eventually the right answer will be retrieved back from it. So associativity is essentially means the grouping of things don't matter. We're always going to get the same result. So in this example, x times y in parentheses times z is the same thing as x times the uh, grouping of y times z. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and very easy to prove. Uh, commutativity, uh, the, the ordering of things that uh, in which they happen don't matter. This is actually really important. So let's say uh, you know that TCP packet was received a couple of milliseconds later on this one host versus that other host. That should not matter. It's uh, we're just creating a, a set and merging them together. So x times y gives us the same product as y times x, and this allows us to know that uh, any time that there's a conflict, uh, these these values could commute, and uh, the order in which the hosts receive them should not matter at all. And they're item potent. So you apply the function, and the function's effect is only going to happen once. So if you try to add something. Uh, 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 Add something to the to a set, for instance, uh, and you get some sort of like failure error. You don't like hear back the operation times out, uh, and you don't know if react got it or not. You could try again, and even if it did make it, uh, and you just didn't know, uh, it won't double uh, what you just did. So that's important. So the objects grow over time, and basically the merge function inside of react for these CRDTs, they're going to compute the least upper bound. Um, again, they're monotonic and confluent semi-lattices, so they're convergent. And here's a couple of examples. So let's say we have three uh, concurrent uh, writers that all write uh, these different values to our same key. So at the bottom, we've got B, A, and C on different replicas. Uh, basically, B and A converge to a set of A and B, uh, A and C converge to a set of A and C, and B and C converge to a set of B and, uh, B and C, and eventually they all converge to a set of A, B, and C. So we didn't lose any data, and we didn't have to do anything at the application layer to know that you just took three different writes, and we still have all of the information that we we're looking for. Uh, you could do this with naturals, uh, with the max function, uh, and you could do it with booleans as well. So if you have something that's false, 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 but one true made it uh, to the database, you know that's always going to reflect a true after that. So, give you an example. Uh, there's this data type that we're introducing in React to. It's known as a set, uh, an, uh, an OR set, so it's observed removed set. So basically it's a set of two sets. The first set is things that the set has had 
had added to it. Uh, and then the second set is things that have been observed that we want to remove from the set. So that when I go to query the set uh, at the end of the day, anything that was removed is going to be subtracted from my result set. This makes it really cool to build applications such as like on a dot com where someone changes their RSVP two or three or four times. Like, oh yes, I'm going to come. Oh no, it's snowing outside. Oh, the snow stopped, but it's still kind of cold, so I'm going to RSVP no. And right at the last minute, they uh, RSVP yes, and they end up coming. Uh, and this type of data type would allow something like Reoc to speak to your application and not worry about, uh, and you wouldn't have to worry about the, uh, the RSVP being wrong because of network partitions, because of individual node failures, because uh, this person hit yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, really quickly. Um, and <laughs> so to, to give uh, you know, a little bit more of a formal example, uh, we're only gonna talk about uh, you know, two replicas in this example. Uh, so, you know, this is basically just a list that contains a, the observed on the left and uh, an empty set in this example on the right would be the removes. So, you know, uh, at one we add A uh, to, each, to each side. Uh, and then we remove A on each side. So, so far so good. There's no conflicts here. But on the left side, at two we add A, uh, but, we, but this other replica just didn't happen to see that update. So what do we do? Uh, eventually we have to just converge them and now both replicas have observed and removed uh, A at one and A added back at two. So basically in our meetup example, this is someone that RSVP'd but then uh, immediately said no and then eventually said yes again but for some reason one of the machines didn't get that update. So just to give another example, uh, at time one we add A and both sides of the, of the set see it. Uh, and then we add at two B. And on the other side, we remove uh, A, uh, we remove that A that we just added. So, so far there's a conflict. Both of these replicas in our database, they, they completely disagree. One says one, uh, or one says A at time one exists in the, in the set, as well as B of, of two, and that's on the right side. And on the left side, uh, basically it just thinks it's an empty set. You know, A was added and then removed. So when these converge, uh, it's going to have first, uh, you know, a set of A and B being added at one and two, and then A removed at one. So thus, the value that we get back is just going to be B. So React is currently versioned at React uh, version 1.4.7, um, and we added uh, our first type of data type, a counter uh, type. And basically, we have uh, this thing called a PN counter where we can add to it and we could remove to it, and it's uh, pretty cool. Uh, the engineers that uh, wrote this, uh, Russell Brown and Sean Cripps, uh, we did this conference back in October of 2012, and they demoed it before we actually ever released this, and it was really fun. They created a network partition, and they added five on one side, and they subtracted five on the other side, and took away the network partition, and I never saw 300 people clap for basic arithmetic before. <laughs> it, it, was, it was amazing. Um, <laughs> So uh, the caveat with these counters is they're actually non-item potent. So like, what that means is if you get a failure when you try to update it, uh, you don't necessarily know if, uh, if your operation made it to the other side. So if you try to retry, you run the chance of uh, accidentally, you know, if you're trying to add five, you might accidentally add 10. Uh, and you know, that's, a, uh, that's a bit of a pain. Uh, so you don't want to track inventory or, uh, or finances with these uh, data types. Uh, I mean, you might want to. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but the new ones that are coming in too, um, we expose them both over the HTTP API as well as uh, the the uh, protocol buffers API, protocol buffers API, which is basically just a binary format uh, for you know faster uh, faster streaming of data. Um, can't use them with uh, the additional query features in React like secondary indexing or MapReduce. So it's just key value stuff. We do have this full text search engine that's also about to land in React 2.0, um, and it's a tight integration with Apache Solar. Uh, so if any of you are Solar fans, it's really, really awesome. It gives you cool features like top rank and, uh, and uh, you know, pagination and faceting. Uh, and you can actually index these data types, which is really exciting. Um, so uh, we're adding sets, so you can add things and remove, the set, uh, remove things from the sets as we uh, as we already went over an example with. 
Uh, and the add is always going to win. So if you end up have some sort of write contention where you're trying to add and remove the same thing at the same time, uh, we design these things to err on the side of the, the add winning, uh, because that just makes sense. Um, so they're nestable, uh, the, or map. We're also adding maps, uh, which are uh, basically an associative array. They're nestable. They're, they could be composed of other types. So you could have a map inside of a map, and that map inside that map, your dog, uh, could contain sets. They could contain the counters as well. Uh, and there's also a few other um, a few other types that are specific to just maps, which are registers. A last write wins register. So you know, let's say you know uh, last time that this was written to, you put a timestamp in there. Uh, the booleans that we you know discuss so basically an on-off leg, true, false, uh, and then you could also again put more sat sets and other maps into them. Um, so the last write wins register type that's exclusive to just the maps. The last writer wins. We've already gone through that. Don't expect that to hold all of your data. There is no resolution. It's just like whatever the last one happened to be, that's what's going to be in there. Um, the booleans, again, enabled or disabled. It's pretty straightforward. And I uh, just wanted to give a quick shout out to this organization that's been organized and uh, funded by the European Union uh, called Sync Free. Uh, they are funding a whole bunch of research to INRIA. Uh, Basho is taking a part of this. Uh, Romeo, makers of Angry Birds, uh, they're also a part of that. And a few other select individuals uh, that are really working to make distributed computing uh, accessible to the masses. Uh, and this is uh, really, really, really exciting. So um, really happy to see uh, this work continue. So you know, in addition to the types that we've already described, uh, once 2.1 of React rolls around, whenever that may be, we'll ship 2.0 first and then then uh, take a look. Uh, you know, we intend on adding more and more of these data types, uh, like ordered sets and all the other cool <coughs> stuff that Redis could do. Uh, but we could distribute data, so uh, we got one up on Redis there. Um, before I continue, um, I'm going to check the time. We got this till what, 7.30, 8 o'clock? Let's say 8. Uh, 8? All right, cool. So that was eventual consistency. Uh, that was effectively how high available stores deal with the problem of concurrency. Uh, and concurrency is a huge issue. The reason why we have these large distributed databases is because, for the most part, the applications that we build today uh, require some sort of semantic that allows us to reason about the database always being there when we try to access it. Uh, it allows us to reason about the number of concurrent uh, connections, uh, not overloading the service as a whole, uh, where we could have you know, either dynamic load shedding or some sort of back pressure involved in, uh, and in place that could allow us to deal with certain things like creating conflicts or, uh, or you know, maybe you know, I write something and then I can't immediately read it back to the data, from the database because it hasn't gotten to all of the servers quite just yet, but maybe retry and a couple of milliseconds later it actually re uh, returns the results that, that I was looking for. Uh, that's cool, and there's a whole bunch of people that will say that that's not a good model, uh, that eventual consistency is evil, that you need ACID guarantees, uh, that the only true type of database has to have ACID compliant in transactions. Um, neither is correct, neither is incorrect. Uh, they're simply different ways of doing this. I will say from my own personal experience and talking to dozens and dozens of companies, uh, the eventually consistent model fits a lot of business cases. And when you stop to think that revenue is typically tied to a user's ability to do something, and if that doing something means you know persisting state to a database, um, and if you have enough users doing something all at the same time, eventual consistency is probably your friend. Uh, again, uh, Jeff Bezos will fire anybody who you know puts something into production that you know makes it such that the technology fails and you can't give money to Amazon. Uh, they had a couple of really high profile outages outages at Amazon in 2004, 2005. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I did the majority of my Christmas shopping on Amazon this year, and it worked like a charm. So, um, strong consistency in a distributed database is an interesting thing. Um, and there's not too many databases that give you something like an acid transaction or anything that we could call strongly consistent. Uh, it requires failing if you don't have the number of nodes available to actually respond to, to the request, which is an unavailability event. So, 
React for the longest time has been an AP system. If we want to talk about it in cap terms, it's been eventually consistent. Um, but it's not a dogma, and we didn't drink any Kool-Aid. So also coming in 2.0, uh, we've got uh, optional strong consistency on a per bucket basis. Buckets for React are just namespaces that you put your keys into. Uh, you could choose your bucket to be strongly consistent. So what does that mean? You sacrifice a little bit of availability, but you're guaranteed read your own write consistency every single time, which is pretty awesome. Um, and I just answered that slide. So uh, yeah, so this gives us single key level uh, atomic operations. Um, this is really, really good for when you have a high churn rate on, uh, on, on your data. So if you were to imagine the, uh, the key being uh, a Facebook wall, which is constantly updated uh, with you know new information. Uh, the most recent thing that you just added to that uh, object or appended to that object, uh, you'll still be able to read it so long as your write request returned as uh, successful. Uh, partial writes is also an interesting thing, an interesting feature of eventually consistent stores and specifically React. So we're, we'll actually talk about that. So this is the other end of the spectrum. Let's say we have uh, object and the value is A, and it's seen through all three replicas. We don't have any sort of machine failures, uh, no network partitions, and here comes our application and it wants to update this key's value to B. So it writes to B, and for some reason, that write failed, and only one of those, uh, one of those replicas got the update. So in React, all of this communication is asynchronous, and it doesn't do any coordination, doesn't do any locking uh, when we're doing these write updates. So that's a very common scenario where that 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 write that just happened that will return to the application as that failed to meet the form. We couldn't write enough copies, and effectively now we have conflicting data in our database. So I mean that's cool. We got uh, you know these siblings that we create, and you know you could just write. Uh, something that will look to see if uh, you know uh, there's anything divergent or this concept of re-prepare where the next time we actually go to read this key, we're going to see that there's conflicting values, B, A, and A, and React's going to be smart enough to say, oh, okay, well, the value's supposed to be B, something bad happened. So it's going to respond B to the client, and it's going to update these values, uh, these A values to B, right? So what happens if after that failure, we have a network partition? And it partitions off the one that uh, received the right. So now, every time that we actually go to get this bucket and key value A uh, is going to be returned to the client. Um, React is awesome at surviving partial failures of your cluster. Uh, in fact, I was just talking to one of our customers the other day, and they had a staffing change where everyone that touched the React service basically moved to different departments, were fired or quit, and their React went unmonitored for four months. Uh, I'm pretty sure in four months' time, there were certain nodes that became unavailable, something broke or whatever the case may be, but React is designed for high availability and it was able to continue operations. People were able to read and write data from the database. But in this particular example, let's say we have this value uh, B that's partitioned off from the network and we just our application just received that failure. It's like, oh, failed to, to uh, write that. So what, what's the logical next thing that we would want to do? Oh, well, let's read the value, see if it actually, uh, uh, if one of them made it. Because if one of them made it, that read repair I just discussed is going to kick in, and it's going to update these values to, uh, from A to B. And if we get return B from that failure, well, then everything's OK. We, don't, we know that we don't have to try to retry, all right? So in this particular example, there's a network partition. This network partition could persist for seconds, could persist for minutes, it could persist for years, theoretically. Um, and all of a sudden, after reading the value A for the longest time and using value A in business logic to charge people money or something like that, that network partition heals. Really good, you know. Uh, and then we read it again, and all of a sudden we've got B, and we were not expecting that. Like, what? So, strong consistency. Strong consistency is going to give us single key atomic operations. What that means is that that partial failure, or that partial write, that only one replica gets the value B and the others could easily get A, does not happen. Uh, again, we sacrifice availability for this. What we need is, in our replicas, at least a majority to be available so that they can come to some sort of consensus. Uh, and it also sacrifices on speed. There's a little bit of a performance hit to doing strongly consistent things. 
uh, and we'll go into exactly what those are. So any get that you do on strongly consistent React buckets are going to see the most recent successful put operation. Makes sense. So our typical write cycle is going to be get modify put, and that is going to fail if that value has changed before. Like so, like let's say you get the object, you modify it in your application, you try to put it back. If it has uh, changed since you since your initial get, your operation will fail. This is uh, the t so we're not doing any sort of blocking uh, in the meantime. There's no transactions here. This is basically strong consistency, which is known as compare and swap. And we're going to compare the values when we're trying to write. And if it has not changed, then we're going to be able to swap it out for our new value. So we'll skip that. There's this concept of consensus. Who knows what consensus is? All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> this is the hardest problem in distributed computing. Uh, basically, this is the problem of getting things to agree. Uh, you could read this quote that I took, well, actually, you probably can't read that, uh, but you can read this quote that I took from uh, Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson from uh, a paper that they wrote, basically uh, entitled The Impossibility of, uh, of, of uh, Consensus. And basically, uh, what it says is that you can't ever guarantee agreement uh, in the midst of failures. So just to give us a, a human example, uh, let's say I have three friends, I, or let, I have two friends, uh, and we're chatting uh, over iMessage, you know, we're texting, uh, trying to figure out which bar we're gonna go to, and it's a group chat, you know? So uh, I, I propose that we're going to go to um, uh, Commonwealth in Brooklyn, which is like my go-to bar. Um, and uh, my other friend agrees, but let's say one of my friends just wasn't paying attention to their phone. Let's say their phone was dead, did not receive those. Uh, me and my friend agreed to go to Commonwealth, and so we're going to be at Commonwealth, and when he plugs his phone back in, charges it up, and he sees all the mixed, mixed test messages, he's gonna be like, oh, we're going to Commonwealth. Or he could maybe even try to send a message like, oh, let's go to Skylark. And we're like, oh, no, sorry, we're already at Commonwealth, and so he would have to come to Commonwealth because we've already agreed on where we're going. So, as far as computers go, uh, there's three properties of consensus. Uh, termination, agreement, and validity. So, termination basically means that processes that are taking uh, place in this consensus uh, thing uh, <laughs> eventually decide on a value, which means we can't always have, uh, we can't have a constant state of voting where people propose new things. Eventually, the voting has to end and something has to be decided. So this is basically our safety guarantee that lets us know that we could make forward progress in the system, such that you know if you constantly have failing nodes or or nodes that uh, you know can't agree on what value is going to be persisted, uh, you know you don't end up just like hanging forever and you can't ever write anything to the database ever again and you go home and cry. Um, so agreement. So. The nodes or the people or parties or whatever that are participating, they have to agree and decide on the same value. Uh, and uh, that's pretty important. Uh, and validity uh, is kind of silly. It's sort of like a non-triviality guarantee, which effectively means that the value that gets set or the value has to have had been proposed. So I could write the best database in the world uh, that no matter what data you write to it, it's always going to respond back as 42 is the answer. Uh, it'll be perfectly correct and it will survive any sort of failure that you could uh, throw at it, uh, except it would be trivial uh, because no one wants a database that always responds 42. So there's a whole bunch of consensus algorithms. Uh, this concept of Paxos, which was sort of like the first major one written by Leslie Lamport. Uh, took the name from this Greek island called Paxos. And in his original paper, and there's many, many Paxos papers, in his original paper, he sort of uh, proposed this concept of consensus by talking about politics in the Greek island and the difficulty of coming to agreement on policy. Uh, Zab, uh, yeah, so Paxos, uh, the first paper was around 1990 when he wrote it. Uh, the part-time parliament is what it's called. Uh, and if you Google Paxos, uh, you're going to see a whole bunch of other papers because Paxos is actually turns out really hard to understand or really hard to implement or both. Uh, so that's why there's other consensus algorithms. Uh, there's Zookeeper Atomic Broadcast, which is uh, an Apache project. Uh, Yahoo is uh, the initial inventors. Uh, 
and Zookeeper Atomic Broadcast, uh, specifically Zookeeper as a service, uh, is commonly used for distributed locking and things of that nature. Uh, and there's uh, you know, a new kid in town called Raft, um, and the paper is literally titled In Search of an Understandable Consensus Algorithm. Uh, and effectively what they said is, while Paxos is uh, provable and it works and it's great, uh, and there's plenty of systems that implement Paxos, uh, they did study, so this is coming out of um, uh, Stanford, uh, with, it's basically the PhD thesis of uh, this guy, Diego uh, Angaro, and his mentor is uh, John Oster, who, for those of you who have beards in the audience, he wrote Tickle. Um, so, um, you know, basically they said that in teaching their students about consensus and Paxos specifically, they were incredibly smart students and they were capable, but they just didn't understand it. Uh, so they wrote uh, this thing called Raft, and it's actually really cool. It's only like seven pages long, and you know, uh, I encourage you to go home and read the Ralph paper, it's really cool. So, for strong consistency in Ralph, we actually use Paxos. Um, uh, it's basically this concept of you have leaders and, uh, and every sort of request that goes to a Paxos system needs to be coordinated, so there's a little bit of blocking and a decision that needs to be made. Uh, and it gets a little expensive, plain old Paxos. It always requires two round trips. So first you have to propose everything to all the people and then you have to ask them if they actually got it and get a response back and things like that. And, yeah, uh, and uh, this is basically uh, what a Paxos uh, round trip looks like. Uh, it's actually really expensive. So there's this concept, uh, an addition of Paxos called uh, multi-Paxos, where this is our very first request. It gives us two round trips, but each additional request could actually respond in just uh, optimistically one round trip or just read from a, a, a local copy. So um, tell them, they're telling me that we're kind of running low on time and that is not too difficult to understand because I like to talk about technology and I could keep you guys here till midnight and talk about strong consistency and eventual consistency. Uh, but I guess I'd like to uh, just say thanks for listening and open it up to questions and then we'll all go to the bar and talk about consistency and strong consistency and eventual consistency. Go ahead, I'll just bring the mic over. 42. What's the performance penalty for strong consistency versus uh, eventual consistency? So the, the question was, what's the performance penalty of strong versus eventual consistency? Uh, the worst case scenario on any uh, on any get or any put is going to be at max two round trips uh, across the servers that are storing the replicas. So with eventual consistency, it's going to be just a single, uh, you know, get the object, deliver it back to the application. So it, the, we haven't done enough extensive testing. We're doing extensive testing at the moment, uh, which is why 2.0 is not generally available. There's some pre-releases available if you want to play with uh, software, find bugs, help us fix them. Um, but yeah, at the, at the end of the day, uh, we haven't really benchmarked out where I can tell you, you know, de facto that, you know, on a 10 node cluster on AWS with, you know, M1 larges, you're going to get, you know, 11,000 ops per sec of an even read uh, balance uh, for eventual consistency where strong consistency is going to give you something like six or 7,000 ops per sec, you know. And this is really, uh, it's going to be variable as well, depending on whether the object has been updated or not and how often. Uh, but for the most part, just imagine that there's going to be a performance hit. And we'll figure it out what it is. <laughs> Yep. Great presentation, thank you. Um, you spoke on the presentation about uh, Spring Heavy CS, so um, massive sort of strong consistency in, in React. Um, but we don't use React as a particularly um, uh, high performance tool. Um, as a no sort of we're really just using it as a global sort of JSON um, intermediary layer. Um, I work as a publisher, and we use the code model for publishing. Um, and in the, um, one of those layers is a highly demobilized uh, database for which we use Mongo. Um, I was wondering a situation where performance wasn't so critical for operation, you could speak to some of the strengths of React versus some of the other NoSQLs that are out there. Yeah, so the question is 
how does React compare to X, with X being all of the NoSQLs? Uh, I think there's a new one every two or three days. Uh, I, don't, I don't read Hacker News anymore, so I can't tell you exactly how many. Uh, so the question, uh, so the, the questioner uh, runs Mongo specifically. Uh, and I'll talk to a couple of strengths and weaknesses on those two, since I suppose most people, if they're talking about NoSQL databases, they're most familiar with. So, uh, React doesn't care what you put into it. It could be JSON documents, uh, and it could be a binary blob, uh, whereas Mongo is specifically for persisting things like JSON. Uh, and React has full text searching available, so that you can actually query against the value and get a result set of keys, which is really, really awesome. Uh, and with the integration with Apache Solar that's coming in 2.0, you're gonna have a whole bunch of extra functionality. Like, so you can drill down your result set according to facets, sort of like, uh, you know, when you're on Amazon.com and you choose, okay, only things that have Amazon Prime and only in this price range, you'll be able to basically filter your results in that way. Uh, so that's really cool. Where Mongo beats React uh, uh, on those types of operations is that Mongo will allow you to update either one or many documents that have a similar schema. Uh, they'll allow you to update just a single uh, field uh, uh, according to a certain term. So like, let's say my JSON document is like, uh, unique user ID and uh, address, you know? And like, let's say the postal code for wherever in New York we are right now uh, changes from 10005 to 10003. You'll be able to do a get to Mongo, uh, or just basically be able to do a put to Mongo for all of the objects where the zip code field is 10005 and update it to 10003. With React, you'd have to update the entire object, so you can't do those uh, cell level updates, and you can't do those multi-object updates in React, uh, like you can with Mongo as well. Um, but, yeah. You have a question? Um, you're using J1? What's J1? Shay. Oh, oh, yeah, the uh, SHA-1 uh, graphic cache for the, the, the ring? Yes. Uh, didn't I hear that that one is uh, not as secure as it should be? It is totally insecure. Uh, we're not using it for encryption, though, or security. It's just, uh, the, the reason why we use SHA-1 is because it's a uniform hash, and effectively what, it, uh, what, it, what we're using it for is distributing responsibility for subsets of data uh, across the entire cluster. It's what we use for machines to choose which uh, data goes uh, here and which data goes there, as opposed to something like Mongo, where you have to pick a shard key and manually say, okay, zero through A goes on this host, and then B goes here, and then like, there's a whole bunch of people with last name C, so they get three, uh, uh, three servers. You know. React is gonna take care of all of that for you. It's operationally simplistic. That's why people use React, because they don't wanna worry about picking the wrong shard key uh, or doing it manually. So yeah. Yes? I've got like uh, 10 questions. Let me just start with the, the easiest one, though. Is, uh, does Mongo, uh, sorry, does Mongo, let's scratch that. Does a React work as a multi-tenant database? If I have like four applications doing the same cluster in the same ring, how, how does that work? And can I tell it, that this is the query or the connection or the client that is slowing down the server when that happens? So this question is two questions in one. The first being, can React uh, serve as a multi-tenant database? And then the second question being, uh, if so, uh, if I've got n applications talking, to it. If one of these applications is killing the rest of the cluster, will I be able to tell? So to answer the first question, depends on what you mean by multi-tenant, uh, because a lot of people mean a lot of different things when they say multi-tenancy. So in the case of React, you could very easily uh, have as many applications as you want right into it. React at the moment isn't going to say, okay, uh, your application X, so you can't write to keys that originated from application Y. There's no separation of data, there's no physical separation, there's no logical separation. In React 2.0, we're adding a concept of security, which is authentication and authorization that's uh, highly influenced by Postgres's model of authentication uh, and authorization. So you'll actually then be able to grant user, you, you'll be able to create roles and grant rights to uh, buckets in React. And that's a way that you'll be able to ensure that you don't have right contention from uh, differing applications on your values. But other than that, you know, if I were to walk into your data center and grab a whole bunch of disks out of one of your hosts, I'll have data from all of the different applications most likely because they're not going to be sent to different uh, nodes. They're, they're still going to be uh, 
uh, mixed up like that. Um, so, so the question that was what the second part was the query. If I have, like for me, multi-tenancy is more about if application A does a release while application B is running, I can maybe assume that changes the responsibility of application A's new release. But if they're running off the same database, how do I actually determine, like without guesswork, that the problem is A or B? Really, really good metrics and intuition. Um, <laughs> so React isn't going to uh, expose to you uh, request level uh, metrics in any way that I can think of that will allow you to determine that these requests happen to be the ones that are doing something bad and evil to the database. However, uh, doing metrics uh, from your application, uh, it should be just a matter of mathematics where if you have two applications, one's doing 10,000 ops per sec and one's only doing 500 ops per sec, most likely it's the one that's you know taxing the hardware with a lot more requests. That's tricky because you, that, that's tricky because you end up with the, the, the situation where a single API call can result in a thousand requests. In, in some cases, like I, I'm used to Cassandra, so it's a thrift issue, right? You have an API call for a multi get, and then multi get is one API call, but it has the number ten thousand. That is one of the arguments, right? So it does ten thousand. Anyway, yeah. Other questions? We couldn't hear you in the back on that last question or comment. Your mic just died. You're in the back. Keeps dying. Yeah, so basically he was saying he's familiar with uh, Cassandra. They run that in production and uh, the thrift protocol as well as Cassandra exposes uh, multi-get functionality where one of the parameters that you can be uh, requesting against uh, is going to uh, create a whole bunch of extra work for Cassandra to do uh, once executed or once received. Uh, sort of to answer to that a little bit, uh, there's no concept of multi-get in React. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, on, the, on, on the other hand, there's no concept of multi-get in React, so you don't get to do that. Um, so yeah. No one else has questions. I have more questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a computer science rap battle. So. <laughs> so, um, no, so, so when you have, in storage on disk, do you have, um, a key, can, it, can the values for a key span multiple nodes, not just the replicas? But can you shard across multiple nodes so that you have, um, uh, so when you have very wide rows that are efficiently stored across the cluster? You're still in Cassandra land. So uh, there's no concept of a row in React. So the value itself uh, is going to be stored on, uh, as that is the replica. Uh, and uh, while you can model uh, something that looks or resembles like a row, uh, it would sort of still be some sort of semi-structured data like XML or JSON or whatever the case may be. Uh, but one replica for one machine uh, and multiple replicas across multiple machines, but you're never going to be able to split half the bits from this value on one machine and half the bits on the other. You, that would actually sort of probably hurt your availability more than help it. So, so the row doesn't actually grow horizontally. What happens is as you add values, each key value in time, time gets sharded out to its own uh, set of replicas. Exactly. Except we don't like the word shard. <laughs> How do you do backups? Uh, it's a great question. How do you do backups? Um, so there's a couple of different things that you could do. Generally speaking, what you do is the uh, same way that you would do an upgrade. You take a node offline, uh, take a file system level snapshot or tar up the data directory. Uh, there's just a single mount point uh, for what you write to React. Uh, if you want to expose multiple devices, you got to do something like LVM or something like that. Um, and once the backup is, uh, or once the snapshot's taken and you ship it off to wherever you ship it to, bring the node back online and continue in a rolling fashion until all of the nodes are complete. That's like the easiest way to do it. Now there's a few other things that you actually do for backing up React. Uh, it depends on sort of what backend storage uh, system that you're using. So React, if anything, exposes maybe too many knobs that you could twist and tune uh, to sort of like milk the performance and uh, allow React to really fit your uh, use case. Uh, and with that said, we've got two persistent data storage uh, engines, one called BitCask and one called BubbleDB. BitCask is uh, inspired by Eric Brewer, the father of the CAP theorem, and it's essentially a append-only write-ahead log uh, that keeps uh, in, in memory a lookup table of all of your keys, their size, their position on disk, and an offset value for uh, for how large the value is. 
So what that effectively means is that any given request to a React cluster that's using Bitcast is going to give you a maximum uh, latency of one seek to disk because you just quickly go to memory, see exactly where that key is, then you seek that disk to that position and then slurp up all the bits. Uh, so with that model, since it's a write ahead log, you can actually rsync your data without turning the uh, node offline. Uh, and that's actually really cool. Uh, but with the other storage engine, LevelDB, it's a sort of string table and there's a whole bunch of compaction stuff that's happening all the time and things get moved around. Uh, the more data that you put into it, the more things that happen. So you can't do that rsync thing without really, really screwing things up. Um, the whole idea though is React is storing replicas already uh, and it's typically easier in our opinion to have sort of a de disaster recovery uh, cluster. So the enterprise version of React that you have to pay us money for, um, uh, <laughs> it comes with a functionality that's proprietary that we haven't ever open sourced and never will. Um, so that's funny. Uh, <laughs> basically it lets you to replicate your data from one site to another. Uh, it could be uh, you know, unilateral or bi-directional uh, replication. So you can have active, active clusters. And one of, the, one of the most sane things is just to have another data center uh, ta taking in real time any writes that go to data center A, they get shipped over to data center B. You don't put any live uh, traffic, uh, no production traffic for any sort of reads or writes to be. That's basically when A goes down, like let's say A is US East. <laughs> and the next time lightning strikes in Virginia, uh, you've got something in US West that you could just sort of flip the switch on your, on your, uh, you know, uh, from your application routing and point all of your uh, traffic to, to West and continue until Amazon gets their stuff together. So you mentioned um, some of, uh, kind of examples of application health records and like a certain network fee, but could you talk a little bit more about what actual use cases people are using it for? This guy works for Basho, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I blew up your spot. He's not a plant, though. Uh, yeah, uh, just, to, just to give you a, a few more ideas. Um, so we're really hot in uh, the gaming world these days. Uh, I mean, it's not the most critical data as far as like life or death situations goes. Uh, but you know, Riot Games, they make League of Legends, uh, it's an MMP, or I always forget that, uh, one of those role-playing games. Uh, and like basically it's the most popular game on the internet. Uh, and it's really important to them that the people could play the video game, because I guess they charge people to like buy things in the video game. I don't know, I don't have time for video games, so I, I used to play them a lot. Uh, also, Rovio, uh, Angry Birds, like they've got I don't know, 200 million active users a month, which is ridiculous. Um, there's uh, a whole bunch of media companies. Uh, oh, so the whole internet of things, uh, 3.2 billion for Nest, right? Uh, there's a bunch of companies that are doing things like, you know, smart thermostats and other smart things that you could build on Arduinos or whatever. And, you know, they emit a whole bunch of data and almost all of it's time series data. And, it actually is a really good fit for something like React because you've got something up in the cloud and uh, all it needs to do is continue to receive new write requests and most likely that's all write once data and maybe read it sometime down the road. Uh, and uh, you just need to have something there to uh, accept all of those writes. And due to the nature of React where if a node goes down, another node's going to basically be a fallback or a secondary to accept any new write requests. Uh, it, that high availability thing is really, really good for this whole Internet of Things or machine-to-machine -machine type uh, data storage. So those are really good use cases. Uh, basically anything that can be modeled as key value, things that require high uptime. Um, and yeah, plenty of, plenty of different people doing all kinds of cool stuff with it. Telephone metadata. Telephone metadata. <laughs> 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 Metadata just in general, uh, really good use case, log data, things like that. Typically, what size data sets would you encourage people to look at React? I assume it's for larger data sets. So the question is, how big should my data be before I start looking at React? Um, for math reasons, we recommend that your cluster start with a minimum of five nodes, which automatically eliminates a whole bunch of people who if their data set is 200 gigs, their managers be like, why are we spending this much for AWS for five nodes when I could fit it on this thumb drive? Um, 
But on the flip side, people look to React not necessarily for the really, really big data use cases, which we can handle. We've got customers that persist, you know, one and a half, two terabytes of new raw data to React on a daily basis. Uh, we've got uh, customers in the advertisement space that you know process over four trillion operations in a given year. Um, so, not necessarily the the reason why people, for the most part, use React for the fact that they have data that exceeds the capacity of one machine, but rather the data that they're working with is so critical that other applications or other services, or maybe even their business as a whole. Uh, would not be able to continue make progress uh, if the database was unavailable, uh, and that's sort of like that's right in our wheelhouse. Can I uh, ask a similar uh, or a follow-on question to that, which is um, you mentioned data sets that that exceed a node, and uh, again, my experience is that when you deal with the JVM, you're sort of limited to a small amount of memory <coughs> relative to what a system can uh, can provide you with for a thousand bucks these days. What sort of in-memory footprint and on-disk footprint can React kind of deal with before you want to add a second order, sorry, a sixth node? Uh, Great question. Um, so, unlike Cassandra, we aren't tied to JK, and <laughs> <laughs> we've got our own VM, the Erlang VM, um, Bjorn's Erlang uh, Abstract Machine. It's a beam. Um, so, one of the really cool things about Erlang is that the VM, for all intents and purposes, actually looks just like your operating system, where the concept of threads is really just processes, and they're very much just like a Unix process. And uh, any sort of operation, any sort of state that we have to pass, any sort of function call that's uh, uh, you know being uh, uh, executed by a state machine inside React or inside the VM, uh, that's wrapped up in its own very little lightweight process. And as soon as that state, that process is no longer necessary, it gets garbage collected by the VM. Uh, so we don't have those stop the world uh, garbage collection pauses or anything like that. Uh, and also, we don't have to worry about managing this one giant heap uh, and do a lot of internal memory management. So all intents and purposes, you really probably don't want to exceed 70 or 80% of, uh, of, of memory utilized. Uh, and if you are seeing really, really high memory, uh, definitely add more machines so that when you add capacity to a React cluster or a Cassandra cluster, basically, effectively, what you're doing is reducing the amount of work each machine has to do since you're spreading the data, thus you're spreading the, the requests, and you're freeing up resources for that individual node. So if you add more capacity when you're getting sort of high watermarks, you're, you're going to save yourself a whole bunch of time in the future because like any computer software, the last thing that you want to do is run out of memory because it's most likely going to crash. <laughs> well, well, the, the other part of that question was on disk storage per node. Oh, and on disk storage per node. Um, same rule of thumb, 75, 80%. So when you're actually adding or removing nodes from the database, uh, there's going to be a background process of handoff where uh, data is going to go from node A to node B, B is going to give node, uh, data to node C, C might be giving data to node A, uh, there's just this internal shuffle that goes on across the network, and it, a node is never going to delete data uh, until all of it's been sent to the person that's getting it. Similarly, it needs to be taking on a whole bunch more data that's much more uh, disk, uh, wants more disk than most likely your typical operation. So you want a nice little buffer, and that really just sort of verifies from case to case. But you don't find there's a quick fall off of a certain amount of data. 100%. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, if I understand correctly, uh, the database is automatically increasing, uh, and the one of the data stores is uh, the right append data store. Mm -hmm. So, uh, earlier data is never really removed. Is that correct? So, that's a interesting question. So, you can delete data from React. Um, there's a lot we could say about that. So when you're sort of like when you're using like the write ahead log with Casca, you know, pen only store, uh, you can only write to any uh, open file. And uh, effectively, once you max out the size of that file, it's going to close that file. It's going to open a new file, and that file becomes read only. Uh, there's going to be periodic merge processes that do garbage collection. Uh, so the 
the way that we version the objects, uh, we use a data type, uh, a data structure called a vector clock, and that's going to be monotonically increasing. Uh, the data on disk in these files uh, is not, mo uh, it, we could remove information from it. So we could actually garbage collect data that has been deleted or data that's been overwritten so that data is no, no longer necessary. So if you were wondering, can I see a full version history of all of the objects in REAC if I update you know, the key A with B, C, D, E, E, F, I said it twice, uh, G values, uh, you won't be able to basically see a transaction log of all of the values. That's not possible. I'm just curious, how long does it take for a, a new node to come up to speed? Let's say we, we maxed out your five and you want to add one more. Question is, how long does a uh, scaling event take when we're adding capacity, just a single node, uh, to a cluster? Um, that's simply going to be a function of how fast your disks are, how fast your network is, uh, and how much data has to move uh, to both that node as well as uh, all of the other nodes. Uh, but once it is online and responsible for partitions in the ring, it'll start accepting requests for them. Yes? Question is, how many nodes maximum can exist in a React cluster? Uh, nobody knows. <laughs> how, many, how many virtual nodes do you create by default? Uh, by default, we create uh, 64 virtual nodes, um, and basically the, that's what the partitions are. Uh, in commonplace, we see 128 or 256. A uh, virtual node in, uh, in React is sort of like uh, a serialization point. Uh, it's going to determine how much resources is dedicated to each individual embedded, embedded database for that partition. So sizing that is kind of important. Uh, but sort of also to answer the question of like, how many nodes can React scale to, like physical nodes. Uh, true story, no one knows what the limit is, simply because it has yet to be hit. We think it's somewhere around 200 or so. Uh, so there's this thing, uh, Erlang has this concept of distributed Erlang, and it's a little bit wasteful on the network, and there's a limit to which you could create these fully connected meshes where the, the, the information that we gossip to each of the nodes to coordinate global uh, cluster state, eventually you grow a cluster to a large enough size and all the cluster could do is say, hey, node A, are you alive? <laughs> yeah, I'm alive, are you alive? Node E, you know, and so on and so forth. So in React 2.0, we're actually, uh, we, we, we're ripping out the legacy gossip that exists in React today, which is really, really dumb. That's basically what does every 60 seconds, it's like, ping, hey, are you alive, you know? Uh, and and basically we're, we're creating a data structure that's sort of like a spanning tree that doesn't have to, it doesn't require all the nodes to communicate to all the other nodes or anything clearly as wasteful as that where it's just as optimistic and it could be pruned over time. So like, you know, if, if node A gets a response from B and C, then it has a known knowledge of node, node B and node C, it also knows of that, but to save space, eventually it could forget about node C if some other node uh, communicates through B to A that it has seen that other node, you know, things like that. So uh, it's based off of this research, uh, if you search uh, for uh, plum tree, uh, that's basically what it is and it actually fit really well for our use case and uh, our engineer Jordan West worked very heavily on that and like he's awesome and that's going to cut down on a lot of the traffic and basically uh, I think it if I recall correctly, I may be making up numbers right now, so don't hold me to this, but I think in his tests he compared the legacy gossip versus uh, the new uh, metadata subsystem, and right around 40 nodes, it was like half as much traffic as previous. Uh, so that's really, really optimistic and reassuring. So I don't know, maybe we could get to 300 with this new stuff. <laughs> we'll find out. If you find yourself scaling to those levels though, first off, you got a lot of data. Uh, <laughs> Uh, how much disk you could cram into a box these days is ridiculous. Uh, but if you sort of approach those high limits, that's when it maybe makes sense to sort of like, you are most likely have subsets of data that could exist in other data centers, and that's when you pay national money. <laughs> Buy my product. All right, sorry. <laughs> Do we have uh, any other questions? All right. Um, well, everyone, we're going to be going to Central Bar, I believe. Center. Center or Central. Central basically, go downstairs, like when you exit the building, it's across the street, 
and to the right across the other street. What's that, Brian? Oh, do you some books or something to give away? Or? Yes. So we're going to go there, but first we're going to do our giveaway. We have, we have questions and we have books for free to answer questions. Is everyone familiar with the concept? All right, cool. So Tom's going to have six questions. What's going to happen is we're going to try to get the first person to raise their hand who gets called on should give the answer. The thing we don't want to have happen is don't call out because I, I can't give you the thing unless we call in because that makes people's feelings good. Um, all right. So uh, the idea is that we have, how many do we have today? We have, uh, it looks like six books and three books. How about we just do a total of six and I didn't cut it off then. Yeah, whoever, when, if you answer the question, just come on up and grab whichever of these you want, either one of the available books or one of the vouchers. So, shoot. All right, start with a really easy one. Uh, name the, uh, uh, name the paper that Amazon uh, published that Reactive in the back middle there? Dynamo. Dynamo. You are correct. Ding, ding, ding. We've got a There's a cool book on MySQL up here. <laughs> <laughs> Who pronounces it MySQL? Why? The, the, the web page actually says, you go to it, it's not the page? Page. Yeah, it actually says, yeah. Yeah, it's like ESS space Q-U-E-A. So when you go to oracle.com slash MySQL, it says, pronounce it MySQL. What, you read it, Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. Um, next question. I'll give you another easy one. MySQL book's still up here. Uh, what programming language is React written? Uh, so, uh, you were the first one up there? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, I saw the two hands up. That is correct. Next time you have to wear different colored shirts. MySQL is not a book, it's a video. Oh, it's a video. And it's PHP. Raise your hand if you still have a DVD player. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Uh, what does CRDT stand for? CRDT stand for. We have one one respondent here. Nice. Very good. Give her a round of applause. Yeah. You want to go for the next one? Uh, and it's not the message goal. And PHP goal. Uh, what kind of hashing algorithm is used in React to distribute data? Green shirt and back? Sorry. Okay, wait. Can we start again? Everyone put your hands down. I'll ask you a question. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's the maximum number of round trips in the strong consistency of React? Uh, right there. Eight? Yeah. Two. Correct. Who wrote the initial Paxos paper? I'm sorry, but I have bias for people in the front because it's easier for me to see, but um, I do think he got it first. I saw it on the back. All right, last but not least, when was month and year React initially open sourced? Okay, so two hands go up and then go down, so I'm going to call on you. November of last year. Incorrect. Okay. I got here. Uh, behind you, actually. Okay. August 2012. Incorrect. Yes. December 2012? No, I mean, you guys just guessed it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone want to go for August? Rob? July. Okay. August 2009? Correct. Yay. Did you just rewind the video? This is We've got to have a rule against people. Uh, yeah, okay, we got actually three more. Um, so we'll, go for it. Go for we'll it. make these easy because I'm thirsty. Um, so, uh, two questions. Uh, first one, name one of the backend storages for React. Spring Jerky. Level DB. Oh, I'm sorry, I saw him go up first. I don't know if you saw him behind the pillar. Oh, okay. I don't know yeah, alright. Alright, name another one. Yeah. Is that right. my sequel thing still here? <laughs> <laughs> it's a video. Oh, yeah. Alright. So, 
<laughs> Our last book is uh, Ubuntu 2013 edition, so it's probably like four versions old by now. Now you wish you had the bicycle. The very last question of the day. Uh, name one of the three properties that need to be guaranteed to assume that uh, React CRDTs eventually converge. They're mathematical. Associate. Correct. Yeah. All right, that's it, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Central Bar? Yeah, Central Bar. Central Bar, again, just on the north side of uh, 9th Street.